Hello everyone, welcome back to the show. My name's Dan, this is Exploder. It's been a couple weeks, so it's time for a brand new episode. Aren't you lucky? Before we start the show, I want to give a quick shout out to Jim Richardson from Chad's Bistro in Rochester Hills, Michigan. Uh, it's a restaurant he works at. Check that out. I'm going to put the Facebook page and put a link on. Um, if you're watching this on any kind of social media, you're going to see a link to them. If you're in that area or anywhere close to Michigan or whatever, come out, check them out. It's a great place. Some people, now some people, call it the Ribera of the Midwest. Now, to be fair, it's just me and Jim, but we're people, so it counts. But one of the reasons I'm giving a shout out, not only is it a great place, but also because recently uh, I have a couple action figures. Shocker. Not a lot, because, you know, I'm 35. But one of my favorites are Axe and Smash of Demolition, one of my favorite tag teams of all time. Well, my favorite tag team of all time. And I've always been looking for a crush. And after talking to Jim, uh, who I've known for a while now through wrestling boards and things like that, he's a big, he's a listener of this. And like I've mentioned before, a lot of the uh, memes that I make, uh, a lot of the photos I get, he compiles them, quite frankly. I get them, I save them, I make the meme, and I put it back out. So a lot of the stuff you see on there would not be here if not for him. And I've given him a shout before, but another shout out for that. But he, I, I mentioned it, I asked him, and I said, you know, how much do you want for Crush? I just want Crush. Um, he was selling a whole, a bunch of them, but uh, he, I said, what for Crush? And he said, you know, don't worry about it. And he sent it to me. So on the video version, I'm going to show you. So I'm going to put Crush, Smash, and Axe together as Demolition. That'll be the first time in my life I've actually hit all three together. And I want to, again, thank Jim for that. And thank Chad's Bistro for being awesome. But considering that I had that, it started to get me thinking. Sometimes I'll come up with an episode. Sometimes I'll have an idea for an episode well ahead of time. And then sometimes it's something that happens organically. Uh, something happens in the news or a pay-per-view event happens and things like that. In this episode, uh, because of my newfound action figure, as it were, thanks to Jim, I started thinking about the role of tag team wrestling. And uh, like everything else, there's a colorful history of every single thing, whether style, every concept, every gimmick. And I think tag team wrestling has a history all its own that is also very unique, which is why I want to look at tag team wrestling in its totality from its, its sort of, I don't want to say shady, but controversial beginnings to the modern day and everywhere in between. And now I assure you, I'm not going to talk about every single tag team because this show will not be four hours. I don't have the energy and you don't have the willpower to sit through it. And I don't blame you for that. But with that said, with that preamble out of the way, let's get to the topic at hand. Tag Team Wrestling actually goes back to 1901, where the first tag team matches were held in the United States in San Francisco. Promoters wanted a new way to make the sport more exciting and more entertaining, and this seemed like the way to do it. Instead of having two people in the ring, they would have four people in the ring. But this didn't become popular outside of San Francisco until the 1930s. Now, there's a controversy about the 1901 date, as there's no documentation to support this at a time where wrestling was a legitimate sport and was reported in sports sections and newspapers and all these different things. So with no documentation of this supposed tag team match in 1901, it's really doubted by many wrestling historians, including Greg Oliver. The first documented case of tag team wrestling was a tornado tag team match on Friday, October 2nd, 1936 in Houston, Texas, where heels Tiger Daula and Fazl Muhammad defeated babyfaces Heinrich Milo Steinborn and Whiskers Savage. Just a side note, Whisker Savage is the coolest old wrestler name I've ever heard in my life. Oddly enough, tag team wrestling was not well received and it didn't really catch on in Houston, although it was basically invented there. Tag team wrestling wouldn't become popular until the 1950s when the style would make its debut and run all over the United States. The NWA itself would start with wrestling tag teams from basically day one. In Tennessee, Jack Purden and Greg Loza Garza Lo Lozano, wow, easy for me to say, became the first men to hold the Southern Tag Team Championship in 1945. So again, the NWA had tag teams almost literally from day one. With his expansion of tag team wrestling around the country through different territories and even through the NWA, there came changes of what became traditional tag team wrestling rules that we know today. Because it wasn't always like that. The original tag team matches, again, in Houston, were under Texas Tornado rules, where all four men were in the ring at all times. The rules were changed uh, through the different territories and became popular as such. The structure, the drama, uh, the tag team matches were two men wrestled at one time, their partner was on the ring apron, waiting illegal tag. The style would ironically make the Texas Tornado style, the original style, more of an attraction, while standard tag matches would become the norm. 
Tag teams would show up in all kinds of NWA promotions around the country, each recognizing their own regional tag team champions. As many promotions had single stars and like that, they would also have tag team champions. Though the NWA itself didn't recognize a national tag team champions until 1982, when the mid-Atlantic version of the titles, part of Jim Crockett Promotions, became the only version of the NWA tag title still active. Since Jim Crockett Promotions was the largest NWA member by this point, and basically what was left of the NWA, the Mid-Atlantic Tag Team Champions officially became the NWA World Tag Team Champions. Tag teams would grow in popularity and produce some truly memorable acts. While tag teams were usually seen as attractions and not necessarily main event matches, some would still be incredibly popular. Among them were the Native American team of Jules and Jay Strongbow, the Moon Dogs, Pat Patterson and Ray Stevens, Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood, Mr. Fuji and Professor Tanaka, Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher, the Minnesota Wrecking Crew of Gene and Ole Anderson, with Gene retiring and eventually being replaced by a plucky 25-year-old named Arn Anderson, and many, many more. The issue that often comes up between tag team wrestlers is the difference between a true tag team and a team where they've obviously just took two singles guys and thrown them together for convenience. True tag teams often have a team name and often have some kind of uh, similar, if not outright, matching gear. The Rock and Roll Express, the Midnight Express, and the Fantastics come in mind when you talk about a true tag team. Two guys who were working together as a team, even dressed together. Maybe jacks were similar, if not the outright same. And the Rock and Roll Express to this day wear the same gear. So that's sort of that difference. Is sometimes they throw guys together as a singles, you know, you know, rip something or other and jack something or other, and they were just thrown together and it's just what they were. And then there were actually guys who were promoted and done as a team. The Midnight Express is a really good example of that. They were a team. The Fabulous Ones uh, was a good one. And all these different guys, they were a tag team. And sometimes, and it happens to this very day, tag teams are actually comprised of two single stars because a particular angle calls for it. And this is not a saying that it's bad, it's just different. How many times has Stone Cold Steve Austin or The Rock or Shawn Michaels or even John Cena been put in a temporary tag team match with a rival to promote their upcoming match? The answer is all, all the times. It happens a lot. Matter of fact, it happens so much that there's even a trope where rivals win the tag team titles while preparing for their upcoming singles matches, often because one of them is the world champion and the other one wants to be world champion. Like when Stone Cold and The Undertaker, or The Rock and The Undertaker, or John Cena and Shawn Michaels, or well, you get the idea. This isn't a bad thing necessarily, though it can be a little overdone, and it seemed at one point it was done. Everyone that The Undertaker feuded with apparently won the tag team titles with them, as I've mentioned. But that said, these angles are sometimes the angle sometimes calls for these temporary alliances to help promote a singles feud. So they don't have direct contact, but they're still next to each other, so it doesn't give away the match itself. So an angle calls for something and it works and it goes that way, it makes sense, but there's a distinct difference between these kind of angles and guys who were tag team partners for decades. And in this episode, I'm going to highlight a couple tag teams, and you can't start, you can't highlight a tag team about tag team wrestling without talking about the Road Warriors. One of the most legitimate tag teams in the history of the entire wrestling business and the team responsible for the phrase Road Warrior Pop. Michael Hawk Hegstrand and Joe Animal Laurinaitis comprised one of the greatest, some would even argue the greatest tag team of all time, The Road Warriors, a takeoff of the pre-Jews Control the World rant Mel Gibson movie of the same name. These two monstrous street toughs clad in face peg and face and spiked shoulder pads were recognizable at least and fucking terrifying at most. They'd come to the ring to Iron Man by Black Sabbath, which is a scare, like the beginning of it, scary as all hell. Then you see these guys with face paint and spiked shoulder pads. You, you, you either ran or you got, made sure you had your money up front. They would come to the ring, take off their death pads, and then commit attempted murder on two poor jobbing souls. Then be back doing God knows what in under 10 minutes. It's what they did, and they were good at it. The team would be together, it would get together in 1983 after, by chance, Animal's tag team partner for the night couldn't make to the show, and Ole Anderson called Hawk to fill in. The rest, as they say in cliche land, is history, as a tag would forever be seen as a preeminent tag team in wrestling, competing on WB Raw on competing from then until their last run on W Raw on May 12, 2003, only months before Hawk's premature death. The team would hold titles in every promotion they competed in as a team including the WF, WCW, All Japan, AWA, and the NWA Mid-Atlantic titles. 
And if you don't believe any of that story, just ask Animal, he'll be glad to tell you. And just like everything else that's popular in wrestling, the Road Warriors had their share of copycast tributes, what have you, which include the Blade Runners, which was early Sting and early Ultimate Warrior, Steve Borden and Jim Helwig, pretty crazy. Both face-painted muscle-head types. You know, it was their first, I don't know, first or second gimmick, but they were a blatant Road Warrior ripoff. The, then there were the Powers of Pain, Warlord and the Barbarian, two bulky guys with weird ha hairdos and face paint. I wonder where they got that idea. And then we get to Demolition. Now, I, I said earlier, Demolition's my favorite tag team of all time. I, some people say, oh, they're just a ripoff of the Road Warriors. I don't think they are. The fact they wear face paint, you know... Yeah, so did the you know so did the powers of pain, and it, even Bruce Pritchard said he thinks the, the the powers of pain were more of a rip off of the Road Warriors than Demolition was, and I think there's some unique differences. But again, I'll get to that. Some people said when they tried to sign the Road when the WF tried to sign the Road Warriors, and Road Warriors turned it down because, quite frankly, at the time of the NWA, they were making way too much money, and the WF couldn't compete with that, at least in their minds. Then they decided to create their own. The gimmick was approached by Randy Colley, who was one of the Moon Dogs. He came in, the story goes, he came in with him and his tag team partner was uh, Bill Eady, who had done years and years as the Masked Superstar. So this was Bill Eady's first gimmick outside the mask, so, it was to, so the fans, it was just a brand new guy, even though it was a re really well-known veteran. People recognized, um, people started chanting Moondog because they recognized Kali. Kali was basically kicked out of his own gimmick, which is ouch, and was replaced by Barry Darso, who had just came from the NWA as Crusher Khrushchev. Now, Demolition were two big, tough guys in face paint who beat everyone up. But I will admit I take an exception to people who just say they were a blatant copy of the Road Warriors because the minute you look past the paint, they're two entirely different things. The Road Warriors were known for being a majority of their careers as destroyers, guys who just hit the ring, showed complete dominance, hit the Doomsday device, and then left to a bunch of cheers. It was simple and it worked, but Demolition was comprised of two, and like I said, with Crush, later three very tough guys, but they were also known for being good workers who did longer matches. Barry Darso had just come for the NWA, like I said, who again replaced Randy Colley. Bill Eady was the mass superstar in the 70s and 80s, was very well known, very solid worker. Two solid workers were given a new gimmick that was similar to the popular Road Warriors, but I couldn't really imagine two teams are any different. You know, you had two guys that could go longer and actually did have much longer matches and were solid workers. So I don't think they were as blatant a rip off as people pretend that they are. And like I said, at the end of the day, and maybe I'm a minority here, I like Demolition better. That's my favorite. If you put the two together, I like, I, I, I understand the look of the Warriors and I understand the pop and I'm not denying their, uh, their popularity, but personally, I like Demolition better. That's just me. Other famous tag teams include the groups like the Fabulous Freebirds. You know, uh, Buddy Jack Roberts, Michael P.S. Hayes, the P.S. stands for Purely Sexy, in case you're wondering, and Terry Bam Bam Gordy. Now, this was really different because these guys were a tag team, so to speak. Uh, Michael Hayes was better talker. Terry Gordy was a great worker, and Buddy Roberts could bump his ass off, and did. They would have introduced a thing called the Freebird Rule, which is where they, when they, when they won the tag team titles. Wow, I'm tongue-tied. They would win the tag team titles and they could defend any combination of the two could defend the titles. Now that's a unique way to do it. It's something that also the that would be used. It's forever be called the Freebird Rule because this idea was introduced literally for the Freebirds. They were so indispensable as a three-man unit. Now this would be later be used by all, well, it'd be used by five of them, I guess, for the Spirit Squad. And uh, the New Days used it. And the Jersey Triad, a, a short of... Uh, often forgotten group in WCW, the Jersey Triad, uh, Chris Canyon, Bam Bam Bigelow, and Dime Dallas Page also used the Freebird role. So just a little piece of trivia there. Six-man tag team titles and various uh, variations have existed in North America, but never really took on. For whatever reason, tag team wrestling is more... Singles wrestling is most popular, tag team wrestling is below it, but six-man is just, for whatever reason, never catches on in America, but is huge in Mexico. That's another cultural difference. I, I don't know if I covered that in the episode where I talk about different countries, uh, the different styles, but in Mexico, six-man tags are a lot more common and a lot more over in America. I mean, Ring of Honor has a six-man tag titles. WCW had a six-man tag team titles for a bit, but it just doesn't catch on as much as even regular tag team wrestling. 
And I think it's because it requires more people, it's harder to book, there's more complication. You know, if there's four people involved and one person gets hurt, injured, you gotta fill that spot. But if there's six, you know, there's six people involved, that's just another factor. I don't know. Maybe it's just more complicated. And fans just don't get into it as much as they do regular tag team wrestling. Now, in my estimation, there are different types of tag team wrestlers. There are the bruisers, the tough guys, the roughnecks. Now, that would be probably, if you had to go, you'd say guys like Demolition, the Powers of Pain, the Road Warriors, as we mentioned. Then you would have the specialists, the technical wrestlers, guys who would break you down and beat the crap out of you in a very technical way. That would be guys like the Brain Busters, Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard. Um, even the Minnesota Wrecking Crew, they would pick a joint and just beat it down. They were tough, but they would be more of a specialist. They would work on, work on a shoulder or a leg or whatever, and they would work efficiently to do that. Then you have guys like the High Flyers, like the Rockers. The Rock and Roll Express, the Fantastics. I mean, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of repeats here, but that's what you'd see. It's a lot of high flying guys. You didn't see those early on. I mean, the early tag teams weren't like that, but then you started seeing tag teams in the '80s, especially. The Rockers were probably that first one of the first ones you saw that were actually doing those those moves. They were both jumping off the top ropes with the punches. They were both doing drop kicks. They were that was different enough, and and th not that they were the only ones, but they were probably one of the first ones that I national level you saw doing that. The WWF in the 1980s was there was no disrespect to the NWA at the time, but the WWF at the time had all the tag teams. They had all of them. They had the Killer Bees, Demolition, the Powers of Pain, the British Bulldogs, the Bushwhackers, the Young Stallions, Strike Force, the Conquistadors, the Bolsheviks. Everywhere from big, bulky guys like the Bolsheviks, uh, Boris Zukov and Nikolai Volkov, to high flyers like the Rockers, to just beat the crap out of you guys like Demolition and the Powers of Pain. They had young guys like the Young Stallions, J um, Jim Powers and Paul Roma. The Killer Bees were two, you know, B. Brian Blair and Jim Brunzel, who were established AWA guys, who were, you know, getting a second chance. They were called the Killer Bees, but, you know, whatever. Now, this was, there was a, I mean, these, they were all these different tag teams. The WF had all of these tag teams. I mean, the British Bulldogs, I mean, heck, the British Bulldogs and the Hart Foundation. If you want to talk about tag team wrestling in the 80s, the British Bulldogs and the Hart Foundation had a great feud. They were doing house shows and where they were talking about how Hogan would go on before intermission and then uh, the British Bulldogs and the Hart Foundation would close at the show. So you want to talk about a main event? That's what they do. They would main event, essentially, the house shows with the tag team matches and really good tag team matches. Some of the some of the best the business has ever had. Now, again, this is another situation where I have all these guys on the undercard who are really good tag team wrestlers, but tag team guys are not the main event. The main event, for a while, included two main event guys who were in a tag team in the Bega Powers. Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan as a legitimate tag team at the top of the card, they faced off against the Mega Bucks, which was under the giant Ted DiBiase, um, and against they would find themselves against other tag teams like the Twin Towers, which was Akeem and the Big Boss Band. All of this was done to put two guys at the top to have Randy Savage at the level of Hulk Hogan. Randy Savage is at the time the world champion, but it was all building up to WrestleMania V, where Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage would have a singles match. So I'm talking about the angles that go from where there are singles, and they're put into a tag team, they have a situation, and then the angle leads to a breakup to where back into a singles match. So like I said, sometimes it calls for that. WrestleMania 4, Randy Savage wins the WF title in the, in the longest, most horrendous tournament I've probably ever seen in my life, not stamped with WCW on the front. They would go for a year as the tag team. They would then break up. The Mega Powers would be the best, biggest tag team in the company, and they would face other big guys. They wouldn't, you know, beat up on the Hart Foundation or nothing, but they would be on their own little plane, and then they would eventually break up, and that would lead to a singles match for WrestleMania 5, where Hulk Hogan would be, defeat Randy Savage to win the world title. A year angle that involves a tag team, and it made sense for the time. Believe it or not, the WWF actually had a women's tag team division before the current division from 1983 to 1989. Um, they bought the old NWA women's tag team titles. Uh, they bought the rights, the belts, and everything from the Fabulous Moolah, who I think owned everything in wrestling belonging to women, including, some would say, some women. The WF actually purchased them and recognized Velvet McIntyre and Princess Victoria as the champions, uh, which officially broke the NWA title lineage. The division basically became uh, about the Glamour Girls and the Jumping Bomb Angels. The division didn't get any deeper than that. Uh, there was a disastrous title switch in Japan where supposedly Fabulous Moolah, which I believe this by the way, but supposedly the Fabulous Moolah told them to, to make a title change in Japan. They couldn't get a hold of Vince McMahon. They did it. 
And when they got back to America, Vince McMahon lost his stack, as he's prone to do, because they weren't supposed to change the titles yet, and the whole thing was being sabotaged by Moolah. And again, I've heard this story before, I believe it. And the entire division was abandoned in 1989. Then, of course, there were the tag teams that went into the 90s. Uh, some things would change up, but these were tag teams that existed in the 90s, some of whom did very well, some of whom were a flash in the pan. You'd have guys like Power and Glory, Paul Roman, Hercules. Hercules was near the end of his WF run, being a prominent guy in the late 80s, but uh, by, you know, 90, 91, he was, it was becoming a thing where he, he sort of outlived his welcome. They put him with Paul Roma, who, surprise, surprise, didn't get along with uh, Jim Powers, and the Young Stallions had broken up in real life, and they put these two together, and the idea, the gimmick, it didn't last long. They were managed by Slick. It didn't last long, but you know what? It was a kind of gimmick that was just, it could have worked if given more time. The idea was that Hercules was power, of course. He was this big, gassed-up freak, and he would do all the power moves. And in the end, Paul Roma would come in and get the pen. That was the whole idea. And they had a great finish, a great finish, where Hercules would um, superplex the guy into the ring, and as soon as the guy hit the, hit the mat, Paul Roma would dive off from the other corner and land a splash. It looked awesome. It was a great finish, and this was a finish back in the early 90s. And that was something that no one else was doing at the time. It was really cool. Again, the it didn't last long, and Hercules himself would eventually be let go, and Paul Roma wouldn't be too far behind. He would proceed to go to the to uh, WCW and become the worst horseman not named Steve McMichael. There was Doom, Butch Reed, and Ron Simmons, a tag team of two two tough guys. Ron Simmons is more consistent than Butch Reed throughout his career. I think that's fair to say because, you know, Ron Simmons showed up a lot and uh, Butch Reed not so much. Anyway, good tag team. They were two masked men who were eventually unmasked to be known as Butch Reed and Ron Simmons. The Steiner Brothers. Now, there's an interesting tag team. Guys that were in the NWA, guys who actually, when Rick Steiner started wrestling, then Scott Steiner started wrestling, they weren't actually a tag team. They were brothers, but they were doing their own separate thing. They were then put together in the NWA. They were the Steiner Brothers. They went to the WF for a very, very short bit, won the tag team titles there, then went back to the WCW and became one of the preeminent tag teams there uh, until... Scott Steiner would turn on Rick in 1998 to join the NWO, bleach his hair, uh, and then continue continue a downward slide to going crazy. On a side note, uh, in light of his, uh, although I do make jokes, in light of his recent health concerns, get well soon. You don't want to see that happen to anybody, so I hope he gets well soon. Not that he's going to hear it, but just a general statement. You know, I hope everybody's thinking of him. Yep, I hope Scott Steiner gets well soon. They would be facing against another brother tag team by the name of Harlem Heat. Harlem Heat came from the GWF, uh, the, as I mentioned before, uh, Global Wrestling Federation, where one of them was GI Bro. They were, I believe, the Harlem Experience or something to that effect. And Ebony Experience, that's what it was. Ebony Express or some. I don't know. I don't have time to look it up. Anyway, something like that. And they would come, they become Harlem Heat. And there was uh, a, a little, uh, they, were, they were there because of, uh, on the recommendation of Sid Vicious. And the, I, I, I think I've touched on before, the original idea was them to be like prisoners in some kind of work release. And they were going to come to the ring in chains and being led to the ring by Colonel Parker. And if you want to know what's wrong with that, look up a picture of Colonel Robert Lee Parker and then get back to me. And there were other tag teams. There was Thunder and Lightning. Uh, that was a really short-lived. There was WW Special Forces, Forces which was... Um, Firebreaker Chip and Todd Champion. They were like a G.I. Joe's type thing. One was a military, I don't know, Green Beret or whatever, and the other one was a firefighter. I, I don't know. Thunder and Lightning were two guys. One was named Thunder, one was named Lightning. Yeah, and... In the early 90s, early, early to mid 90s, the WF stopped focusing on tag teams. Now, they still had tag teams, but it wasn't as big. There weren't as many. There was a lot of tag teams the WF in the 80s. They were running two house show loops, and they had all these tag teams, and only really quality tag teams. In the 90s, they started shrinking down. They didn't have as many. They would focus on particular tag teams like the Smoking Guns, Billy and Bart Gunn, who debuted in 1993. And again, I've talked about the career of Billy Gunn before in a previous episode. There's a whole divergence that happens in their career, and I'll, I'll get to what happens there uh, in a general sense. Then there were teams like the Godwins, Henry O. Godwin and Vinius I. Godwin, H.O.G. and P.I.G. because it was 1996, shut up. The Body Donnas, Skip and Zip, because 
1996. And the Head Shrinkers, Samu and Fatu. Samu would leave the company to be replaced by uh, the Barbarian, who is now going by Sioni, which is his real first name. There would also be these random tag teams of younger, lower card guys that weren't doing anything, like 1-2-3 Kid and Marty Jannetty would win the tag team titles, and 1-2-3 Kid and Bob Sparkplug Holly would win the tag team titles, and so on and so forth. And again, they would use the same angle of, of two top talents, putting together a tag team, and being used to split. In this case, with Shawn Michaels and Diesel as the tag team champs. They would then have a split at Survivor Series 1994 that would, basically, that would split them up on TV. They would basically relinquish the tag team titles as a result. The night after, Diesel would um, kick Bob Backlund in the stomach and jackknife him in seven seconds and win the world title. And this was used, this split and title win was used to set up, say it with me, their match at WrestleMania 11 because it's a system that works. Two guys who were put together that were sort of seemingly random to put together but actually were very successful were Owen Hart and the British Bulldog. They both had successful singles careers and tag team championships at the same time. At one point, the British Bulldog was the tag team champ with Owen Hart and the European champion. These were two guys who were good singles wrestlers and good tag team wrestlers. And they were part of the Hart Foundation, so it's one of those very rare cases where they were both and could do both and, and were two talented guys who could. Then around the mid... I would say about 97, 98, you started seeing tag teams sort of come back a little bit. And one of the tag teams that we want to talk about is the New Age Outlaws. They were two lower card guys. They weren't doing anything. They were like, hey, on a whim, what the hell? Let's throw them together. What else do we got to lose? And then they would go on to become one of the best tag teams in the WWF's history. Road Dog was at the time the real Jesse James, the real Double J, uh, who was supposedly the real singer of Jeff Jarrett's hit, with my baby tonight, which is saying you're the real Double J is like saying you're the real garbage man. Uh, no one cares. So that wouldn't go anywhere. And then at the time, Billy Gunn, who after a split with his brother Bart from a reasonably successful tag team, especially at the time, uh, didn't do a whole lot. And then he became the protege of the Honky Tonk Man because that's a step up. He was called Rockabilly. Oh God, he was called Rockabilly. Finally, the Road Dog would come to the ring. Oh, he's called the Road Dog now, by the way. Jesse James dropped it, became the Road Dog, came to the ring, offered Rock and Billy a spot as a tag team partner. They turned on Honky Talk Man, as they should have, and they went on to become one of the best tag teams of all time. And not for the work, because the Road Dog himself admitted he was not much of a worker. He's a good talker, and Gunn was the worker. But they worked together because the whole package was great. You come to the ring, I mean, to this day, if you're a wrestling fan, you were a wrestling fan at this time, you heard that intro to that music, those, those original chords, and you heard, oh, you didn't know. When you hear that, you know exactly what's going on. You know that's the New Age Outlaws, and you knew you were gonna, if nothing else, you were gonna be entertained. You knew you were going to be entertained, if nothing else. Then there were the role of tag teams in ECW. ECW was known for a lot of things, blood and guts, but they also had some of the greatest technical wrestlers in the world, the Eddie Guerreros, the Chris Benoit's, the Dean Malenko's, but they also had some very, a variety of tag teams. If you wanted brawlers, they had the Public Enemy, who were guys who, to be fair, Ted Petty could do a lot more stuff, but Ted Petty made more money as Rocco Rock, the hoodie from Philadelphia wearing a hockey jersey. They made more, He made more money doing that than he ever did when he was flying around the country, when he was flying around the ring as a guy who was like a precursor to the luchadors. And Johnny Grunge was there. Then you had another tag team, the Gangsters, which included one member who was never officially trained to be a wrestler in New Jack. New Jack said he was never trained. And if you watch him, you believe him. Uh, this guy knows, this guy has the wrestling training of a guy who opens packages at Home Depot. And to be fair, they both have, bo they both have uh, box cutters. And you have Mustafa Saeed, and they were, again, two brawling tag teams. But I'll tell you right now, the Gangsters, one of the most prominent feuds for the Gangsters was a team called the Eliminators. John Cronus and Perry Saturn were two, let's just say it right now, John Cronus was a weirdo. And, and it's unfortunate that he's passed away. As a matter of fact, uh, both members of Public Enemy and uh, John Cronus has, has passed away. And that's very unfortunate. I'm not going to make any light of that. But John Cronus was a weirdo in real life and in the ring. But he was also a guy at, what was it? I think it was 290. I think someone said he was 290, 295. He could do back, cartwheels, backhand springs, moonsaults, 450 
50s, he was a freak in a lot of ways. I mean, he could do things a guy his size shouldn't have been able to do. He never looked like he had a great body, but man, he could do what he could do. What he could do with that body was crazy. You had Perry Saturn, who was, you know, career in the military, strong guy, and was able to do, the, you know, did the Death Valley Driver, uh, who was famously did that uh, elbow off the scaffolding. This guy was a very talented guy. You put them together, they were known for these over-the-top t- tag team moves, namely Total Elimination. John Cronus would do a uh, spinning leg sweep, and no, Cronus would not do it, no. Yeah, wow. Okay, I'm going to leave it in, I don't care. Perry Saturn would do the spinning leg sweep, John Cronus would do the car, uh, the spring wheel kick, and they would knock the guy out. And it lo- and depending on how the guy bumped, it looked amazing. But again, these were two guys that you weren't going to necessarily get a half-hour classic out of, but they were guys that could do certain things very well. So Paul Heyman, knowing what he did, accentuated the positives. He took two guys who had a certain look, who had uh, the abilities that they had, and were able to a- accent that. They weren't going to be the brain busters, but they didn't have to be because, damn it, they were the eliminators. You also had, to, you know, we talk about brawlers. You also had brawlers like Balls Mahoney and Axel Rotten, two guys who were known for, they were literally called the chair swinging freaks, two guys who were known for swinging chairs and fighting. Not bad workers, just sort of what they were, but they were, again, put in a situation where they accentuated what they could do. One of the most prominent tag teams in ECW history, actually, was Rob Van Dam and Sabu, who were top guys. Rob Van Dam, of course, was the TV champion through most of his tag team title runs with Sabu. He held the title for almost two years, in addition to winning and losing the tag team titles with Sabu. They would feud with Sandman and Tommy Dreamer, who, again, two singles guys who would put in tag team matches. And these were not every show. Quite often, these four men would be different matches against different people and singles matches and tag team matches and whatever. But it was something where they were put in a situation where they could be in a tag team. And Rob Van Dam and Sabu in particular were known as a tag team for quite a long, quite a while on TV. During this time, in 1998, uh, ECW did something very cool. It was really good. It It was a tag team division. It involved the tag team titles. It involved friends, betrayal. It was really great in how they intertwined all this stuff. Chris Candido and Lance Storm became the tag team champions who couldn't stand each other. Now, let me explain. In November of 1997, Rick Root is in ECW because at that point he had to be in all the companies. That was the law. And he was finding new opponents for Shane Douglas to challenge for the ECW heavyweight title. Finally, when all the everything has gone through, finally he's found a new challenger. And that challenger is fellow Triple Threat member Bam Bam Bigelow who betrays the triple threat and wins the ECW world title. Now, though, ostensibly, this would be so that Shane Douglas could go back to Pittsburgh in November, to remember, 1997, and win the title from Bam Bam Bigelow in his hometown in a show that he helped strongly promote. So it was a great story there. Now, Bam Bam Bigelow is no longer in the triple threat. During this time, they pick up a kid named Lance Storm with a flat top and a rat tail for some reason. Lance Storm is a prospect. Not, not a full Florian member of the of the triple threat, which means he couldn't do the three fingers move, the the 3D basically he couldn't do that. But he was he was he was a prospect, and he was gonna he was showing promise during that time. He and Lan- he and Chris Candido won the tag team titles, so that continues that story. This sets up a match between the triple threat, Chris Candido, Lance Storm, the prospect, and Shane Douglas against Bam Bam Bigelow and Taz. Bam Bam then turns on Taz and rejoins the Triple Threat. The group immediately turns on Lance Storm, kicking him out of the group. So he never became officially a member. He was always a prospect. And the minute he thought he was in, he got kicked out again. And so, But again, they're still the tag team champions. So Candido and Storm are still the tag team champions and defend the titles. They're not stripped of the titles. They continue to defend the titles, despite the fact they don't like each other, despite the fact they keep fighting during matches against each other, and then they somehow kept winning. So that was something that was different. I li- I liked how they did that. I think TNA years ago would try something like that, but it didn't come off the same way, and it just sort of was more convoluted. But this all made sense in the long scheme of things, and I always thought that was interesting. Again, two top guys who became... Who top level guys who were actually in a tag team first was the Impact Players. The Impact Players, Just Incredible and Lance Storm, were two top heels, and they got put together to face off against the departing Shane Douglas and Tommy Dreamer, who were at the time called the New Triple Threat. Although a third member was never introduced because Douglas would leave the company. The Impact Players were a huge, again, a big thing. They would only be disbanded after Just Incredible won the world title, and Lance Storm would leave ECW to go to WCW and lead Team Canada to prominence. 
Another tag team you can't talk about in wrestling without really mentioning this tag team is the Dudley Boys. Bubba Ray and Devon Dudley, two guys who were not originally supposed to be tag team partners. They were part of a large family of a bunch of random ne'er-do-wells that most of which no people even remember. There was Dance with Dudley and Chubby Dudley and Dudley Dudley and Snot Dudley and Dick Dudley and Spike Dudley and Bubba and Devon. Am I missing anybody? Sign Guy. or Sign Guy. And then there was just a bunch of indie knockoffs and whatever it was a take on the old the hansen brothers right the hansen brothers from slapshot and the story is as old as time and i'm sure ravens told it twenty-seven thousand times i mean hell he invented it that's not the point the dudley boys were not originally supposed to be a tag team bub and devon were sort of put together as the remaining members of the dudley boys sort of faded away with the exception of dick and spike and sign guy um but Bubba Ray and Devon Dudley became one of the most successful tag teams in the history of the wrestling business, and some are now arguing that they are a better tag team overall than the Road Warriors. Now, of course, Animal will never admit this um, because his standard of greatness relies on you have to win titles in every territory that you ever competed in, despite the fact that, um, by the way, Animal, there are no more territories. So the criteria he thinks for greatness is something that can never happen again. It just, it won't happen again because it can't happen again. So, whatever. But some people argue the Dudley Boys are the best. And of course, they held the ECW titles. They held the WWF titles. They held kind of the WCW titles. Of course, they were after they, WCW had been bought by WWF. So it's a whole thing. They held the TNA tag team titles. They, each of them had held, you know, singles titles. Whether Devon held the uh, TNA TV title, Bubba would win the... TNA heavyweight title. I mean, there's so many things, but they, they were a great tag team. Great, um, just one of those tag teams that were just existed for so long. They came together in 1996 and they were together for well over almost, I think, two decades. Even having a another run in the WF, they came back and did a, another run in the WF after years of prominence. They went to TNA, they came back and they had another run putting over the new day on the way out and now Devon works behind the scenes as an agent and Bubba Ray Dudley is Bully Ray and he's kicking ass in Ring of Honor so again you can't overlook a tag team that's that good and exists for that long in so many different promotions and over in all of them and also they have a kick-ass finish the three days just freaking awesome one thing I want to touch on real quick are the tag teams in Japan because some, quite frankly some of them have some great great names which i love one of the most famous ones are a group of gaijin or foreigners uh, the miracle violence connection of terry bam bam gordy and dr death steve williams i love that name the miracle violence connection it sounds like a really weird j-pop band for some reason but damn it they were not the toughest sons of bitches on the planet you know uh, Gordy and Williams, Gordy and Doc at that time were, they were the tag team. They were running all over Japan, all over all Japan, kicking ass. Now, they came to ECW in 1996. They had uh, what I can only describe as one of the most disappointing matches I've ever seen in my life between them and the Eliminators. But that match, the end of that match, people don't remember that match, but people remember the end of the match, even if they don't realize it, because the end of that match is the famous clip of Perry Saturn diving off of the scaffolding or the little platform between the scaffolding L with an elbow drop, which was probably by that point, that, that was probably a good, I don't know, 15 feet above the ring. So he dove off this thing with an elbow drop. That was from the Eliminators versus the Miracle Violence Connection match. So just a little piece of trivia there. Then there's the, the Jurassic Powers. That actually sounds pretty cool too. That is comprised of Scott Norton and Hercules Hernandez. So again, two big, powerful sons of bitches. Uh, the team was called the Jurassic Powers. I think that's pretty cool. One of my favorite, though, my one of my favorites was two native Japanese talents, tough guys, but the Holy Demon Army. This was Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tao. First of all, Toshiaki Kawada uh, invented the Gonzo Bomb. If you never see the Gonzo Bomb, type it in G A N S O Gonzo. Uh, it was a botch, but it became a move. And Japan's really good on protecting moves because they're, you know. Uh, like Kenta Kobashi only did seven burning hammers, if I remember correctly. I think he did it seven times. So it was one of those things where if he pulled out this ultra finisher, you didn't, not only were you pinned, you were probably dead. So this was called the Gonzo Bomb. It was only done a few times, but basically it's a vertical, it's a pile driver, but you're not holding the guy's head. You just hold his legs and you drop the guy on his freaking forehead. And it was a botch. Uh, because he had broken his arm and he knew, like, I think Kawada had broken his arm or something and he knew he wasn't going to get him up for a power bomb. So he just dropped straight down and dropped the guy, dropped uh, Masawa straight on his head. So Kawada's a tough guy. 
uh, retired, but tough as hell. But anyway, they were called the Holy Demon Army, and I absolutely love that name. Just wanted to get that out there. Then you would talk about, like, talk about earlier, the role of tag teams on a card. Tag teams may main event shows, but the reality of a tag team is the tag team is a attraction, not the draw. The single star is always the draw. The company is always built around a single star. It's always built around a Hulk Hogan or a Steve Austin or a Rock or a John Cena or whoever the hell Vince McMahon wants the next guy to be but hasn't found yet because you know he's scrambling right now. TLC matches were showcase matches. You know, you talk about Edge and Christian or uh, the Hardy Boys or the Dudley Boys or what have you with these TLC matches. These were great, but they weren't in the main event either. They were attractions. Road Warriors may have had their pop, but Hulk Hogan main evented WrestleMania. That's the big difference. Then you have the concept of the end of a tag team. When a tag team ends, what happens? Well, a tag team ends, they split off to become single stars. Now, there's a peril that comes from the split of a tag team, what happens afterwards. Sometimes what happens after a tag team splits off is just as important, especially for the individual. It's as important as what happens to the, what happens when they are in the tag team, what happens after they're a tag team. There's always the peril of a tag team breaking apart and one succeeding and one sort of disappearing. You see that with Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty. Some people use the terms, you know, someone's the Marty Jannetty of a tag team. Well, it's meant by that because between the two, and this is partly because of a star power thing, but it's also partly because of personal decisions on the part of Marty Jannetty. And I think even he'll admit that if he's sober. Shawn Michaels went on to become one of the best wrestling, wrestling performers of all time. I mean, legendary, just absolutely the greatest. He's a Hall of Famer twice now, DX and individual. And if they ever put the click in, he'll be in three times. He's amazing. Marty Jannetty became a punchline. You know, he had a couple, he had more than a few shots at WF. They kept rehiring him. He kept getting fired. They kept rehiring him. He kept getting getting fired, so on and so forth. And he works in the Indies and he's got a messed up foot and he's sending texts, he's sending tweets about if it'd be okay to sleep with someone he thought was his daughter or something or haha, it was a joke. Anyway, or Bret Hart and Jim Neidhart. Bret Hart was a, clearly the star. Jim Neidhart became who? Literally, he became who? And then later you'd have examples like Booker T and Stevie Ray, where Booker T became a five-time, five-time, you get the idea, WCW heavyweight champion, would win the title in the WF, would go to TNA, is now WF Hall of Famer, you know, works on TV shows. Stevie Ray, you know, I'm not, not you know, nothing against him, but, you know, if you look at the two, he's clearly not the star of the team put it that way then there's a sort of the middle there, there's two guys that that go off and sort of become their own thing but they do okay for themselves in the case of scott and rick steiner scott steiner was clearly the bigger star but rick still worked rick was working in wf well until well, wcw well until they got sold rick was a solid mid card guy u.s title and and all these different things scott was clearly the bigger star but the last group which i talked about magnificent seven in a previous episode rick steiner was part of that group so this guy's on tv he's prominent and but he wasn't he wasn't the top guy but there was two guys that split off and they both did really well for themselves and then the dip, the, the splits happen that quite frankly in the modern day the guys who split off are not always the the, the disparity is not too drastic in the case of edge and christian i mean edge of course became multiple time world champion and and has become a legend but at the same time christian he did okay for himself you know it seemed like he wasn't going to but then he became he won the world title uh you know and he's won all these different titles intercontinental and other and tag teams with other people he's done well for himself so again there's not a huge drop off between them or matt and jeff hardy jeff hardy's clearly the bigger star of the two but matt hardy's done very well for himself you know so th- these they're not as drastic as, say, a Shawn Michaels and a Marty Jannetty. Let's put it that way. Then we have to talk about the idea of the rehashes, the new versions. Ain't Like I said before, anytime you put new in front of a tag team, it's going to fail. I don't care what it is, it's going to fail. Like in the case of the new Men I Express, Bombastic Bob and Bodacious Bart, which is exciting is exactly what I just said. Just thrilling that didn't go well obviously the new rockers which was marty Jannetty and leaf cassidy which is another case where marty Jannetty became the marty Jannetty because leaf cassidy would then go to ecw lose his damn mind grab a mannequin head and then become al snow the crazy person and would have a second life in his career and marty Jannetty was still marty Jannetty. the new blackjacks in the case of blackjack Wyndham and blackjack bradshaw uh, of course one of them would go on well 
Wyndham would become part of the NWA angle, which would fail, and then he would go to WCW and that whole thing and become a West Texas redneck because that's the natural progression in wrestling. And Bradshaw would become part of the AP, become an acolyte, then he'd become the APA, and then eventually he would become like a cowboy hardcore guy, I guess. And then the APA would get back together, and then he'd become JBL, which has been ever since. And there was the new versions of things like the LOD 2000. Oh, dear Lord. When they they decided that no one knew who the hell the Legion of Doom was. Legion of Doom, Road Warriors, same thing. Dudby couldn't trademark the Road Warriors, so they called them the Legion of Doom. And they had Hawk and Animal, and they gave them, like, new gear and, like, hockey helmets and the shoulder pads. Admittedly, the shoulder pads look pretty awesome. Less spikes, but more of a cool design. And then when they started playing up the fact that Hawk was having some, uh, drinking issues they were having him play a drunk in the ring at a time where he was completely sober which was classy so he was sober but he was playing drunk because he had actual drinking issues but not when he was sober it's complicated then they would add darren drozdov into the group as puke or draws or whatever and again a nice guy but it was like it, it's like when it'd be like if metallica let me just say that it's like if metallica got a new front man or it's like whenever these old bands get a new frontman, like Queen. Nothing against anybody, but you're not Freddie Mercury, and it's not the same. You know what I mean? It, it's nothing against you, but it's just not the same. And that's what this was. This was, okay, you had Hawk, you had Animal, you had, you know, they were interesting enough, they were the big destroyers, whatever, and it was a nostalgia trip. And then they go, hey, we're going to introduce this new guy. Who's this new guy? It doesn't matter. He's going to take, so the whole plan was eventually to replace Hawk with draws because they wanted a second it was it wasn't good so LOD 2000 became a failure because it was trying to introduce an element to an act that didn't need it and then of course they would do it again um, when they were promoting the Elo, the Legion of Doom DVD set, uh, Hawk by this point had passed away. This was in 2005. Hawk passed away in 2003, like I said. And they would introduce, they would not just have Animal come on and promote. They decided they were going to have Animal work again, and they were going to put him with a, new, a member of the new Legion of Doom, uh, the least deserving guy on the planet, Heidenreich. That's right, I said Heidenreich. The guy who read poems and then talked about an invisible friend of his. So then they thought, you know what? Let's put him with Animal. They didn't change his gear, by the way. They just put face paint on him and shoulder pads. They didn't change his stupid plain tights. And it went it went awful. Just, just awful. Rehashing a tag team like that is a dumb idea. It's just dumb. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Uh, it's just a bad idea. Now, what's the legacy of tag team wrestling? The role in modern wrestling. How modern teams are used. Now, modern teams right now in WBF are... I'm going to say WB right now because that's really where we're going to start with. But you have guys... You, there's a little bit of stagnation in the main roster. Guys like the Usos and the New Day. Um, Gallows and Anderson and things like that. Guys, it's... I mean... For a while, the Usos and the New Day were working so much, I couldn't tell you what year a match was from. They would just work a match after match after match after match. And it's not that they weren't good. They had a Hell in a Cell match that was really good. Or they'd have good matches, but it was just like a match. It got to the point where they had it to where the Usos and the New Day called a truce. They actually got in the ring and, as you know, in gimmick, right? But they basically called a truce that said, you know, we've been fighting all this time. Let's just stop. We beat each other up enough, and they shook hands, and that was the end of it. Because even they knew the angle had gone too long. You know, Gallows and Anderson were a very powerful tag team in Japan, and they came into WF together as a tag team. That was different. That's something that hadn't been done in a while. Usually the only guys that would come in like that as a team would be guys with a renowned uh, story or a renowned uh, legacy in front of them. You know, guys like the Road Warriors. But they were able to come in. The revival is very interesting because they were bringing back old school wrestling. The way they were tagging in. I mean, it was very reminiscent of the Minnesota Wrecking Crew. Very reminiscent of Arn and Ole Anderson. You know, how they pick a joint. And they would they were doing stuff that was old school and different. Even things like the ring jackets. But it was something that had been done before. But it had been so long, be it had been so long since it was done. The fact that they were doing it again made it novel. And, and I actually like, I like, I like that. I like the revival. I think they're very unique and really good at what they do and the rumors are right now that they're going to be leaving the WF when their contracts are up and probably going to AEW and quite frankly I can't blame them if they do I can't blame them then there's the tag teams that are elsewhere well, you know talking about AEW there are guys like the Young Bucks who are I don't like that I don't, not to get too far into it, I don't like the Young Bucks. I think they over rely on the super kick, but you can't deny that they have done a, they have done a lot with what they have. 
they have you know they have a certain amount of talent and a certain amount of ability but they've been able to do a lot with it the lucha bros which is ray phoenix and pentagon jr who are real brothers in real life amazing luchadors i mean just great they were in pwg lucha underground now they're in aew and they're just kicking ass and it's a great you know two young luchadors who are just kicking ass you know there were established wrestlers getting a second life in aew as tag team wrestlers like the scu uh kazarian christopher daniels and scorpio sky you know those are three guys i mean especially when we're talking about kazarian and christopher daniels those are guys that sort of got you know they had their chance in tna they got over to a point but it just never felt like they were really ever going to go forward with them and now they're in aew and they're getting a second chance and you know they're two guys who've been in the business long enough they can be used to really still work they're still working and doing pretty well but it's also the thing where they can teach younger guys and get younger guys over which is pretty awesome a group called the the dark order which was formerly super smash brothers because that was a name that even they knew you couldn't put on television uh their you know their angles doing pretty well and and you know so there's a lot of there's a lot of young tag teams and a lot of guys that are gonna it's gonna be different it's gonna be lighter i mean the age the the days of the twin towers you know those big lumbering guys beating the crap at each other those are not that there aren't any but they're pretty much gone the tag teams now are younger and they're they're faster you know they're you know they may not all be the lucha bros you know they may not all be the young bucks you know some are going to be the revival but they're still exciting they're exciting in what they do but the big lumbering guys aren't that thing the destroy there aren't that many destroyers you know the bru the bruisers whatever there aren't that many left not to say there aren't any but there's not that many Re wrestling now is a lot more technical it's a lot more athletic and that extends to the tag teams as well so that's that's where i uh look at it that's why i look at you know pro wrestling and how tag team wrestling has evolved and it's become more homogenized in a lot of ways where like i said there's a lot more tag teams that are doing a certain style but that style is very entertaining and it hasn't changed it's changed a bit but the role in the companies remains the same well that's going to do it for this time i hope you enjoyed this i know i went quite a while with this but there's like i said there's so much in history there's so much in wrestling history we talk about tag teams from the you know the established tag teams from all the way back in the day to i mean guys that are still in the ring right now there's a lot going on and i think it's very interesting but until next time my name's dan this exploder have a good one <laughs>